Hello, and thank you for joining Cure Alzheimer's Fund for this webinar on why amyloid is a fundamental issue in Alzheimer's disease. My name is Meg Smith, and I'm the Executive Vice President for Research Management here at Cure Alls. Today, we're going to hear a wonderful talk from Dr. Robert Vassar, a pioneer in the study of amyloid, followed by a brief Q&A. But before I introduce him, please let, allow me to take a minute to introduce Cure Alzheimer's Fund. Founded 17 years ago, Cure Alls has one mission, to fund research that will accelerate prevention, treatment, and a cure for this disease. To that end, we have supported over $130 million in extraordinary research pursued by brilliant and dedicated scientists around the world. All of this is possible thanks to our dedicated donors who share our drive and determination to end this disease. We are held accountable for this mission by our board of directors. They, with certain other dedicated supporters, cover all of our operational overhead. That generosity means our wonderful donors know their gift goes 100% to support research. The science we fund is selected by our research leadership group, comprised of experts across scientific specialties relevant to Alzheimer's disease. All of our scientific decision making is done by active researchers who themselves are at the forefront of Alzheimer's discovery. Dr. Robert Vassar, our speaker today, is in fact a founding member of our research leadership group and a member of its executive committee. He is the director of Northwestern University's Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at the Mesulam Center for Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease, as well as the Davy Professor of Neurology at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern. As one of the discoverers of beta secretase, about which we'll hear more shortly, and the creator of one of the most commonly used transgenic mouse models of amyloid pathology, he is truly a giant in the study of Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Vassar, thank you so much for being here today and helping us understand the role of amyloid in Alzheimer's disease. Well, thank you so much, Meg, for that generous introduction. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present this webinar. I hope that what I'm gonna tell you today will help clear up some of your questions about amyloid and why it's important for Alzheimer's disease. So first, I want to mention a little bit about Alzheimer's disease pathology. Alzheimer's is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder. That means that over time, the brain degenerates, and particularly the, the neurons of the brain. Neurons are the brain cells that are important for just about everything for how the brain functions. Um, it's important for our memories. It's important for our thoughts, our actions our personalities, neurons are all involved in all those very important things that we consider uh, very integral to our, our beings. So here, I just wanna show you what the Alzheimer's disease brain looks like here on the left. You can see that compared to normal brain, uh, it's, uh, it, it looks more shriveled. Uh, the spaces between the wrinkles of the brain are increased, it's, it's smaller. It weighs less. These are all signs of severe brain atrophy as a result of the neuro neuron degeneration and neuron death. Here's another diagram here of the Alzheimer brain when you look at it in cross-section compared to the normal brain. And you can see the size difference. Uh, the Alzheimer's brain is much smaller. Again, the spaces between the wrinkles of the brain are much increased. The spaces within the brain called ventricles are enlarged. And in particular, there is severe degeneration in regions of the brain that are important for memory, like the region of the brain called the hippocampus. In the Alzheimer brain, um, it is very shrunken. It's literally non-existent here in this particular diagram. On the left, you see what the normal hippocampus should look like in the normal human brain. So there is very severe brain atrophy, degeneration and death of the neurons, and there are two hallmark lesions of the Alzheimer brain called the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles, which I will tell you more about in a minute. There's also a lot of brain inflammation. We all know about inflammation in the rest of our bodies, like uh, inflammation of joints, for example, that becomes very painful. So we believe that inflammation in the brain is, um, is also part of Alzheimer's disease and contributing to the disease process. Alzheimer's really is a disease of aging. We don't yet understand why aging 
predisposed uh, uh, causes Alzheimer's disease in some individuals. Um, we know that age, you know, that young people never get Alzheimer's disease. We still don't have a clear answer to that, but um, we're working on it. And there are many other questions about this disease that we will be uh, addressing uh, in, in our research. And hopefully I can answer some of those questions at the end. So this is a microscopic image of Alzheimer's disease brain as it appears in the microscope. And you can see here the two major lesions of the Alzheimer brain. These lesions are the amyloid plaques, which are the sort of the brown balls that you see here that the arrows are pointing at. They're composed of a protein called amyloid beta or A beta. So I'm going to be using those terms interchangeably. Sometimes I'll say amyloid, sometimes I'll say A beta. It's all the same. And these, uh, these little balls, as I said, are composed of the amyloid beta protein. Uh, there's also another lesion called the neurofibrillary tangle. These are composed of the protein called tau, and they this tau protein fills up actually inside the neurons of the Alzheimer brain, whereas the amyloid plaques are on the outside of the neurons. Um, and as I said before, inflammation is also a big part of Alzheimer's disease. And all of these factors are contributing to the degeneration of the neurons, the important brain cells that um, are important for memory. There's also loss of synapses. Now, synapses are the connections between the neurons. So neurons communicate with each other via electrical um, charges, and the synapses are important for communicating between one neuron and another. There's a lot of synapse loss, which means those neurons cannot communicate with each other as well as they do in a normal brain. Uh, of course, if there's neuron death, then uh, there are less neurons to communicate with each other. So that's uh, also a very serious component of this disease. So this is a diagram that I have borrowed from my colleague, David Holzman at Washington University. And it kind of shows what we think is our best understanding of what's going on in the Alzheimer brain in terms of the progression of the pathology. The, the, it seems like the whole disease begins with the accumulation of a beta, beta amyloid. And that's shown here by this uh, squiggly red line sort of structure here. Now, a beta is a very sticky protein. It's, it really likes to aggregate with itself and with other proteins. And what happens over time in, the, uh, in people that get Alzheimer's is that the A beta accumulates in the brain into these amyloid plaques. Now the A beta is made by the neuron. Uh, that neurons are the major source of the A beta in the brain. However, all of the tissues of our body make A beta. Yet for some reason, A beta really accumulates only in the brain. We don't really understand exactly why that is. It's probably because neurons make so much of it. At least that's part of the story. Um, but what happens is the neuron makes the A beta. It then uh, releases the A beta outside. And then other molecules, uh, proteins of A beta, then accumulate into these amyloid plaques. Once that occurs, there are um, immune cells of the brain called microglia and also astrocytes. These are support cells in the brain which have an immune function. They recognize the amyloid as uh, being a foreign body, if you will, and they surround it and they actually try to get rid of it, but they are overwhelmed. They really can't do a very good job of clearing the amyloid from the brain. Uh, they get quite uh, uh, inflamed, however, and they release these inflammatory proteins, for example, interferon, uh, interleukin-1 and uh, tumor necrosis factor are a couple of the inflammatory molecules that are released. The astrocytes also release several of their own molecules that are inflammatory. And we think that these inflammatory molecules are also playing a role in uh, 
causing damage to the neurons. A beta probably has a direct damaging uh, uh, propensity on the neurons because we see the, that the long processes of the neurons called axons begin to degenerate and form these structures called dystrophic neurites. Other changes occur within the neuron uh, which involve the tau protein. There is a dysregulation of phosphorylation of tau and once tau becomes hyperphosphorylated, it accumulates into the uh, and self-aggregates to form the neurofibrillary tangles. Once that occurs, the neuron is probably going to die. I don't. Uh, we're hoping uh, at least research uh, is looking into the prospect that if we could remove tangles or prevent them from forming, perhaps we could keep the neurons from dying. But we believe that the tau um, tangles are very detrimental to the neurons. So um, over the last several years, there's been a big advance on identifying um, how to identify amyloid in the brain as well as tau pathology in the brain. And one of the biggest, I think, uh, important discoveries was the use of positron emission tomography brain scanning to be able to identify amyloid and tau pathology. And so these are some examples of brain scans here for amyloid uh, on top and tau pathology on the bottom. Now, what these PET scans have revealed is that amyloid pathology begins first and then appears to lead to the tau pathology later on in the Alzheimer's brain. And this conclusion is also supported by different tests of the cerebral spinal fluid and uh, also the blood that again show that amyloid pathology begins first and that tau pathology appears later on in the Alzheimer brain. And these are in living people. So now we are able to, in a, a living person, watch the pathology as it develops. In the past, we only had uh, brain autopsies at the end of life where we could look at the brains and determine um, whether the person had uh, any amyloid or tau pathology. So amyloid, our best guess right now is that amyloid pathology may act as either an initiator or an accelerator of tau pathology in Alzheimer's disease. So um, this is a figure that was originally made by Dr. Clifford Jack at the Mayo Clinic. And what I'm showing you here is, um, and what, what Dr. Jack wanted to show is that Alzheimer's disease is, is a progressive disease and it takes many, many years, even decades to be able to develop. And what I'm showing you here by this red bar is the amyloid phase of the disease, which it takes place over 10 to 20 years and maybe even a little longer. The red line depicts the accumulation of amyloid in the brain um, over this 10 to 20 year period. And then it begins to plateau. And, and, and then there is very little amyloid accumulation after that point. And, it, and these vertical lines depict the, um, the clinical manifestations first of mild cognitive impairment or MCI, which is a memory disorder that uh, in some individuals progresses to Alzheimer's disease, particularly if people have MCI and amyloid in the brain. The second vertical dotted line represents the border between MCI and dementia. So dementia is when a person not only has memory deficits, but also has dysfunctional uh, dysfunction that causes them to um, have reduced uh, quality of life. Their, uh, uh, their activity of daily living is then impacted beyond just the memory domain. So as you can see here, amyloid is really occurring in this asymptomatic, in this pre-symptomatic phase of Alzheimer's disease, even before there are any memory um, deficits. 
Um, the, the other pathology, tau pathology, is the blue line. So that's also coming up in this pre-symptomatic phase. Um, but it, there's a threshold at which then tau pathology causes memory problems and eventually the dementia. Brain structural changes come a little bit later, shown in green. Um, and um, memory, memory is uh, shown in purple. And finally, the clinical function, which is an indicator of dementia, is the dark green uh, showing up last. So what I really want to say here is that, um, as you probably know, there's been a lot of news about Alzheimer's disease clinical trial fail failures over the last uh, several years. In fact, over 99% of the clinical trials in Alzheimer's have failed. This is honestly an abysmal record. And um, as scientists, we were really struggling with why, why do we have such a terrible success rate? And I think the answer at least partially lies in the fact that we're, all the clinical trials are occurring in this disease phase, this symptomatic phase of, the disease, of Alzheimer's disease after there are memory problems with mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And, and so when you're targeting amyloid, which is occurring out here uh, as a therapeutic target, then you can see that you know you could target amyloid all day long, um, and it's not really going to affect these later stages where the tau pathology has taken over, and the amyloid pathology is uh, at that point pretty much exhausted. So the field in the last several years has decided, or at least has come to the realization, that clinical trials should be conducted um, uh, at least for amyloid in this pre-symptomatic phase. And these would be prevention trials. So, um, and that's where the field has been going now. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the anti-amyloid therapies that are in the works now for AD prevention that we'll be treating in this preclinical asymptomatic phase of the disease. So, this is a, a diagram to show you how a beta is, is made in the brain. As I told you before, neurons are the primary source of a beta. They make the most a beta in the brain. And uh, a beta is actually part of a much larger protein called amyloid precursor protein, or APP, which is shown here. The a beta part of APP is this uh, little yellow squiggle here. So it's, it's inside the protein, and it needs to be released from the protein by the action of two enzymes. These enzymes act like molecular scissors. Um, and these two uh, enzymes are the beta secretase, which I was involved in discovering um, now over 20 years ago. Uh, we uh, also named it base. Um, it's synonymous with beta secretase. It is the pair of molecular scissors that cuts first and uh, releases this fragment of APP, which just kind of floats away. And uh, we're not sure whether it has a function, but um, it is not involved in Alzheimer's disease. After that beta secretase base when cuts, there's a second pair of molecular scissors called the gamma secretase that comes along and cuts uh, down here to then release the uh, A beta peptide, this yellow little yellow squiggle, which is then secreted, which is released from the neuron. And as I told you before, A beta is very sticky and it particularly likes to stick to itself. So it forms these small structures called oligomers that maybe only have a few of the A beta molecules. Um, these oligomers might in fact, be toxic to neurons themselves. And there's a lot of evidence to support that. But over time, the A beta assembles into these much larger structures called fibrils. The fibrils are, in fact, the components of the amyloid plaque. The plaque is uh, made mostly of A beta. 
And there are a few other proteins mixed in there as well, but A-beta is by far the major component of the amyloid plaque. Now, what is the evidence that A-beta really is important for the initiation of Alzheimer's disease? Well, most of that evidence comes from human genetics. And to date, um, actually over the past 30 years, this, well, this hunt for um, disease mutations occurred now 30 years ago. And to date, there are over 450 mutations that cause a very severe early onset form of Alzheimer's disease called familial Alzheimer's disease. These mutation, mutations occur in the genes for amyloid precursor protein itself, which as I told you is where uh, the A beta comes from. And, uh, and then there are also two other genes, uh, the genes for presenilin 1 and presenilin 2. And what's interesting about these two genes is that the presenilins are components of the gamma secretase. That is the second pair of molecular scissors that generate the A beta. So um, all these mutations do the same thing. They increase a longer form of A beta called A beta 42. Uh, A beta 42 is even stickier than regular A beta. There are several forms of A beta. They're all sticky, but A beta 42 is the stickiest form. And it really promotes, A beta 42 promotes self aggregation into these oligomers and amyloid fibrils. Um, and it's, as I said, it's the major component of amyloid plaques. So this is a very, um, very rare uh, form of early onset Alzheimer's disease. But uh, just like in other diseases of the human body, human genetics really teaches us about, um, about the causes of disease and even very rare types of um, diseases of genetic disease can inform about the more common diseases that um, are, for example, sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which is the major common form of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, both the familial Alzheimer's disease and sporadic Alzheimer's disease share uh, identical pathologies. It's just that the familial Alzheimer's disease is much earlier onset and much more aggressive. There is also genetic evidence in that there is, uh, in cases of APP gene duplication, as occurs in trisomy 20, 21 or Down syndrome, Down syndrome individuals have early onset Alzheimer's disease because they have too much APP and they make up too much A beta. And um, also important is. Uh, now, this is more related to sporadic, the more common form of Alzheimer's disease. Um, there is a protein called apolipoprotein E. And there are three forms of ApoE. And the epsilon-4 form, called ApoE form, is present in over half of the individuals with the common sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And um, this ApoE4 is associated with greater amyloid accumulation and earlier onset of age, early, earlier age onset of Alzheimer's disease. So it is a very important uh, component of Alzheimer's disease pathology. And what Dr. Holzman's work has shown us is that ApoE4 promotes the aggregation of A beta and actually promotes the seeding of the amyloid plaques from A beta. So there is an interaction between ApoE4 and A-beta, and that this interaction causes more amyloid plaque formation. Uh, finally, to date, uh, there are genome, what are called genome-wide association studies, and they've identified over 165 AD risk factor genes. And many of these either affect the production of amyloid or its clearance from the brain. Finally, I want to mention um, an important mutation that was found several years ago, which is actually a protective mutation in amyloid precursor protein. It is the A673T mutation, and it is uh, shown here, circled in red. And uh, this pair of scissors right here uh, denotes where the beta secretase base one cuts 
APP. And as you can see, the mutation is only uh, one amino acid away from this cleavage site. And this change, uh, this mutation, makes the uh, base molecular scissors less able to cut right here. So that means there's less A beta that's produced, and therefore this is protective for Alzheimer's disease. So in sum total, there's a huge amount of genetic evidence from humans that A beta is playing a crucial role in, uh, in the early phase of Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. Now, um, also what's important to our discussion is that there are genetically engineered animal models of Alzheimer's disease, particular, particularly the amyloid precursor protein transgenic mice. These mice have amyloid plaques. They show abnormal tau phosphorylation, which uh, mice don't make the tangles, the tau tangles, the neurofibrillary tangles that humans make, but they do have the abnormal tau phosphorylation that is also shown in humans that leads to the tangles. The mice have neuronal degeneration. They form the neuritic uh, dystrophies that are the damaged axons of the neurons because of the, the toxicity of the A beta. They also show inflammation in the brain and they have uh, behavioral and electrophysiological deficits. This is a mouse brain here and the little brown dots are the amyloid plaques. Um, and this is a close-up of the amyloid plaques just to show you that the amyloid pathology in these APP transgenic mice is very similar to that of the human AD brain. So as I said before, the vast majority of evidence, both human and um, animal model evidence, suggests that decreasing the production or increasing the clearance of A beta from the brain should be beneficial for Alzheimer's disease. Now, um, in the last uh, several minutes, I want to go talk about some of the, um, the therapies that are in development. These are disease-modifying therapies, as opposed to the therapies that were um, only treating the symptoms, which are avail currently available, like um, Aricept. So these uh, largely are the beta amyloid antibodies listed here. And I'll go into a little more discussion of aducanumab, which is marketed under the name Aduhelm. There are also beta secretase inhibitors and gamma secretase modulators. Uh, in particular, the modulators, gamma secretase modulators, this is work by Dr. Stephen Wagner um, that is uh, work that's funded by the Cure Alzheimer Fund. And we're very excited about these gamma secretase modulators that they may be able to reduce the amount of A beta 42 and therefore stave off the uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, the generation of the amyloid and therefore um, um, be preventative for Alzheimer's disease. The beta secretase inhibitors, unfortunately have been discontinued um, due to side effect issues. However, uh, my colleagues and I are working on um, maybe other alternative approaches where we would use lower doses of the beta secretase base inhibitors and therefore avoid some of these side effects. So this is uh, an antibody shown here uh, and it's bound, it's binding the beta amyloid. This is how antibodies work. In particular, we're going to talk about the, the anti-A beta antibody called aducanumab. So in clinical trials with aducanumab, uh, there is uh, a very clear dose-dependent decrease in amyloid from the brain. So this is an example of brain scans for amyloid in uh, individuals, specific individuals that have been treated either with no drug, the placebo, either a low dose, medium dose, or high dose of the drug. And um, this is their baseline condition when they, right at the beginning of their treatment, and one year later after treatment, you can see uh, that the amyloid pathology, which is shown in red largely, has been vastly decreased in the individuals that have had edu uh, aducanumab. And as I said, this is a both a dose and time dependent reduction 
in amyloid uh, shown here. So this is the adjusted mean change from baseline. Okay, so negative numbers means reduced amyloid in the brain. As you can see, the placebo here at week 26 basically did nothing. But with increasing doses, you get a very nice reduction, a dose-dependent reduction in amyloid in the brain. This is also true at week 54. And as you can see, the reduction is even greater, uh, meaning there's a time-dependent reduction in amyloid. So this was uh, very exciting news. Um, unfortunately, the clinical trial did uh, had equivocal results on whether or not there were uh, improvements of symptoms of memory symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, one trial uh, did, re did reduce the progression of Alzheimer's disease dementia, but the other one didn't. So this uh, is basically a, a bit of a controversy in the field. However, despite that, the FDA gave provisional conditional approval to aducanumab, and now it's in what's called a phase four, which means it's out there in, in the public, and uh, Biogen, which is the company that makes aducanumab, has now, uh, I think, eight or nine years to be able to really show and prove that this drug is effective against not only amyloid, but also the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I mentioned prevention trials earlier. There are at least three different prevention trials that are ongoing right now uh, using, and all of them are involving different anti-A beta antibodies. Um, it's um, just briefly to mention, these are the anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease or the A4 trial. This is going on in cognitively normal a beta positive subjects using these two antibodies, solanuzumab and lecanemab. There is also a prevention trial in individuals that have the familial Alzheimer's disease early onset uh, mutations. This is the dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease network trial, or the DIAN-TU, which um, has been following families that have these familial Alzheimer's disease mutations. And, um, and so cognitively normal individuals from these families that carry these mutations will be treated or are being treated with these two anti-A beta antibodies, gantineurumab and solanuzumab. And um, unfortunately, the trial just you know, read out and unfortunately, solanuzumab uh, did not work, but there was a very positive um, indication that gantineurumab was able to move the biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, the amyloid uh, and the tau. And so this is uh, in an open label extension trial right now. So we'll see over the next several years whether continued treatment with gantineurumab might slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Finally, the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative, or API, are testing these two antibodies, uh, cronazumab and donanumab. Um, this is similar to the DIAN trial in that there are mutation carriers. This is a familial Alzheimer's disease mutation that is found in uh, the, the country Colombia. And uh, because of the geographic isolation of the population, this mutation has spread throughout the, the local region. And uh, there are many Alzheimer patients uh, and subjects that carry this mutation. And uh, the company Genentech is seeing whether cronazumab will be able to uh, stem the tide of Alzheimer's in these familial AD patients. Now, donatumab is a Lilly drug, a Lilly antibody, and um, it is going to be treating cognitively normal APOE4 carriers that have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Donatumab in a separate trial by Lilly had very encouraging phase two results and, um, and really met, in fact, met their cognitive endpoint 
in the phase two and now they're onto a phase three in um, uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease. But this uh, prevention trial, I think, is uh, going to be really important to keep our eyes on that over the next several years. So just to finish up, there are several unanswered questions, which um, Meg and I can probably pick up on in our discussion. We really don't yet understand aging. What is it about aging that predisposes individuals to the accumulation of amyloid and Alzheimer's disease? Also, we as a field don't understand very well why A beta is triggering tau pathology. There is obviously some type of interaction, but we don't know the molecular details yet. As I told you, uh, inflammation is a major component of Alzheimer's disease, and in particular, the innate immune system and the microglial cells of the brain are playing an important role in that inflammation, but we have not yet um, really completely cracked the nut on that particular problem. But there's a lot of work going on in that area, and in particular, uh, research the Cure Alzheimer Fund is supporting. Now, what are the real toxic forms of A beta and tau? This is still an open question. The oligomers I, I told you about are toxic. I also think that the fibrils are toxic and uh, particularly cause the neuritic dystrophy that are, is surrounding the amyloid plaques. That's the damaged axons and uh, dendrites of neurons. So, also, we're not too clear about the mechanism of the synaptic and neuron loss. I think that gets to what um, are the toxic, the toxicity of A beta and tau. We need to learn more about that. And finally, there are individuals that have really a brain full of amyloid and tau, and yet they appear resistant or resilient to this pathology, and they don't develop Alzheimer's disease. So we're very curious about why they are protected. And uh, that's ongoing research for the future. So this, I just want to show briefly my group here at Northwestern. Uh, they are listed here by name. I also want to mention my collaborators, in particular, Dr. Rudy Tanzi. Um, and uh, he's been collaborating with, uh, with us for a long time, a very fruitful collaboration. I also want to thank my funding sources, the National Institute of Aging, and particularly the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. Uh, Cure Alzheimer's Fund donors have been so generous with their funds, with their donations to the fund, and, um, and your very kind and generous um, gifts are really fueling the research that is propelling us toward our end goal, which is finally a, a cure for Alzheimer's disease for treatment either a prevention or a treatment against this devastating neurodegenerative disorder. So with that, I'll end and I'll hand it back over to Meg. I really appreciate this and, and I appreciate you giving in some opinions. Uh, I know as a scientist, you like to stick to the facts, but we're all wondering what makes you excited right now? What, are, what makes you hopeful about our fight against Alzheimer's disease? Well, I think, you know, over the past several years, it's gotten really exciting, Meg, um, with these, particularly these um, A-beta antibodies that, that like aducanumab. And um, I mean, one thing, I mean, we, we can say aducanumab is a controversial drug, yes. Um, the decision to conditionally approve it by the FDA is controversial, yes. But there's one thing about edu, aducanumab that really is unequivocal. It clears amyloid from the brain dramatically well, as I showed you from those images. That's very exciting because all the evidence that I've told you about today um, and, and in the field overall suggests that amyloid is a really important trigger of Alzheimer's disease. And if we could get rid of it early enough, we could prevent the damage to the brain. Because once the neurons are damaged, they're not coming back, probably. I mean, once they're dead, they're not coming back for sure. But um, it's it's still not known whether a damaged neuron would would be able to reform its synapses um, even after you got rid of the amyloid. So we want to get rid of the amyloid very early before there's any damage to the brain. 
And these antibodies are capable of doing it. So I'm excited about that. The base so, inhibitors. Go ahead. No, I was the base inhibitors. I'm I'm also excited about them, although you know, uh, the, the luster has sort of um, gone away from them a bit over the last several years. But I think that we might be able to bring them back at a, a lower dose where, where the dosage is safe and we can avoid the side effects to the base inhibitors. So that's my plug for the base inhibitors. <laughs> so you said that uh, we produce amyloid all over our brains. Um, do we produce it all through our lives or is it something about aging that's triggering more of it or the start of it and when when do we need to start worrying about amyloid well that's a very good question it it appears to be made throughout life throughout all tissues of the body um but the brain seems to make the most of it and of course we have the blood brain barrier to contend with so probably because the brain makes more A beta and there's the blood brain barrier, getting rid of the A beta is more difficult for the brain. It's not difficult when we're young, but there's something that happens probably around middle age, the brain begins to change or something about the brain changes that um, the, the clearance of the A beta is somehow slowing down with age. We don't really understand why, but over a long period of time, decades even, this slow, slowly increasing reservoir of A beta builds up to the point that the amyloid begins to deposit into these amyloid plaques. So um, I, think, I think that's probably, you know, my gut is telling me that that's probably the reason. It's something about clearance. Um, and aging. And it's, it's even possible that, that there could be increased am, uh, a, APP, for example, um, either due to inflammation or um, there was even a recent paper out suggesting that in sporadic Alzheimer's disease, there's an increase of amyloid precursor protein levels, um, expression, and uh, that maybe there are gene mutations that goose up the, uh, the production of APP and therefore the development or the production of A-beta. So we've got a lot more work to do on that. Um, so you, you were very um, clear about how the genetic underpinnings of autosomal dominant or early onset Alzheimer's disease really are about the overproduction of APP and the um, increase in cleavage towards beta amyloid for those folks. Do we have good reason to believe that something that helps in that early onset version of Alzheimer's would also help in sporadic? How should we think about those? Are they the same disease or are they different diseases? Um, that's a great question. I, I think um, I would say that the end result is the same in both in both diseases. Um, there, in in the early onset form, you overproduce a beta, and that produces a very early onset accumulation of amyloid and early onset disease. In sporadic Alzheimer's disease, you have also the accumulation of a beta, but it occurs at a later age. But the end result is the same. It, it's uh, accumulation of amyloid plaques the formation of neurofibrillary tangles, inflammation, and um, memory loss, and dementia. So it's, it's, it's probably more a matter of the, the aggressiveness is, is, is much more in the, in the familial genetic forms as compared to the sporadic later onset forms. Um, so any, and so what we've learned about Alzheimer's disease is largely from the familial early onset genetic forms. But it's true that uh, this has occurred in other aspects of medicine where mutations in particular very you know, rare genes, very rare gene mutations inform about a particular disease. A, a good example is heart disease and uh, the story of cholesterol in heart disease 
which uh, started with a very rare mutation and led to the path, cholesterol pathway that uh, discovered the statin drugs for lowering serum cholesterol. And that's been a lifesaver. So I think that our study of genetic all forms of Alzheimer's disease will lead us to the same, in the same direction to ultimately a cure to Alzheimer's disease. So sometimes you hear people say, well, it's the tau pathology that, that starts to show up around the same time as cognitive symptoms. So we could just wait until that happens and stop tau and then it wouldn't, you wouldn't have to worry about anything. Does the amyloid pathology cause damage on its own or does it only cause damage because it triggers the tau and other forms of pathology? Well, I think the amyloid pathology itself does cause damage to neurons. I think that's very clear. Um, I didn't uh, show you an image, but when we look in the microscope at the amyloid plaques, and uh, when we also image the surrounding axons, we find that in the immediate vicinity of the amyloid plaque, the axons are completely swollen and dysfunctional. They, um, and in fact, they look like they are degenerating, and this cannot be good for the function of a neuron when their axons are degenerating. So um, I think the amyloid on its own is causing a problem. Um, and that problem becomes translated to the tau pathology. Whatever dysregulation is occurring in the neuron caused by the amyloid toxicity, um, this is transmitted to the cell body where um, tau becomes dysregulated, it becomes hyperphosphorylated and forms the neurofibrillary tangles. And, and so I think that's also dependent on the toxicity of beta amyloid. Um, to the original question about, you know, why don't we just wait for the tangles to form and then treat the tangles? Well, there are approaches, therapeutic approaches now in clinical trial to do just that. And I, I completely support it because uh, we need combination therapies for Alzheimer's disease, much like we have combination therapies for other diseases like heart disease or HIV. Um, and we need a, a toolkit of different drugs to be able to treat different people with the disease. But I would argue that by the time you have tau pathology and um, it, it's probably too late. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're going to have a lot of damage to neurons at that point. It, memory problems start when tau begins to take off. That means that there are damaged neurons, damaged axons, damaged synapses, maybe even dead neurons as well. So I'm, I think I would like to push the field toward prevention, just like in heart disease. So if we could prevent the accumulation of amyloid before there is damage or or when there's only a, a small amount of damage before there are tangles, that's probably the best situation. You know, you don't, you don't have memory problems at that point. You don't have a lot of damage to neurons and other brain cells. And if we could stop it at that phase, then we would prevent Alzheimer's disease completely, I believe. Uh, well, I've, I just want to ask one more question um, because this is something I know we, it matters to all of us. While we're waiting for those combination therapies you're talking about, are there choices we can make that science tells us will, will be more likely to lead to less amyloid pathology? What can people do while we're waiting? Well, that is another great question, Meg. And, and certainly there are, there are a few things we can do. Uh, they're mainly lifestyle things things like exercise. One of the strongest preventatives uh, in, life in terms of lifestyle is exercise, is particularly cardiovascular exercise. It seems that what's good for the heart is good for the brain. And um, that's, that's important to get, to have good cardiovascular, a good cardiovascular system to support brain function. And perhaps that helps clear amyloid. Also, it's important to get our sleep. I, I know it's a problem. I, I'm a, I try to preach to myself about this. I need to be better about my own sleep. But um, it's clear, again, from 
uh, Dr. Holzman's work that um, reduced sleep in people and in the mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, reduced sleep makes the pathologies worse, both, I believe, uh, certainly for amyloid, but I think also for tau pathology. So everyone should try to get their eight hours of sleep every night if possible. Um, that's, that's also important. Um, a good diet of healthy whole foods is, is really important. The Mediterranean diet has often been touted as uh, being important for many different diseases, heart disease, diabetes, but probably also for Alzheimer's disease. Um, fish have good oils. Fish oils probably promote good brain health. Berries, nuts, vegetables, you know, it's, uh, it's making me hungry just talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's, that's about all we have. I mean, hopefully, Educanumab will pan out that it will work. Uh, it's a very expensive drug, but, but maybe there are other drugs. What, we, what we're trying at, in the, at the gamma secretase modulators is to, rather than have an expensive antibody, have a tiny little pill that you could take by mouth, and that would be a lot cheaper um, and uh, probably just as effective as these expensive antibodies. So uh, we've got a lot of work left to, to do as a, as a field, and uh, the Cure Alzheimer Fund is really doing um, really yeoman's work in um, helping us, the researchers, get to the, get to the, the goal, which is a, uh, a treatment, a prevention, uh, or a cure for Alzheimer's. So thanks to all the donors out there. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Bob. And and really, without the wonderful work of you and your colleagues, we know we can't get anywhere. So I share your gratitude to our donors who make your work possible and the work of Carol's possible. I um, thank you again for your time and your insights today. I know everyone out there will have enjoyed them, as did I. And we will look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Thank you, Meg. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs>